the National Justice Commission. Also, I had to be. I tried to forget Chief Justice Sayers, Dr. Mutuma. Uh, welcome. We are giving you this welcome on behalf of our two hosts, um, the Heinrich Bohr Steve Toon, um, represented here by the regional director, Mr. George Paul, and by Kabrak University, represented here by the vice chancellor, Professor Henry Kiplagat, accompanied by our two deputy vice chancellors, uh, Professor John Achola. DVC Academic and Research, and Professor Ronald Chepkilot, DVC Finance and Administration. Um, together with uh, Professor John Ambani, John Osogo Ambani, the Dean of Cabra Law School, um, together with his faculty, all protocols observed. I'm hoping that that is uh, going to relieve everybody who comes up of the need to go through the protocols. Welcome very much. You may have your seats. Um, we are a bit late and we are cognizant of that and we apologize. We shall try to rush along to get to the meat and bones of this event as fast as possible. So I invite our chaplain, um, to come and give us a short motivational, a short, just come and take a look. Ladies and gentlemen, our chief guest and the rest, allow me not to focus on the protocols for now, but let move quickly to a devotional reflection for just a few minutes. If you are able to access this, you can check. I'm reading from the book of Micah, chapter 5, chapter 6, Micah, chapter 6, verse 1 to verse number 8. Listen to what the Lord says. Stand up, plead your case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear, O mountains the Lord's accusation. Listen, you everlasting foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a case against his people. He's lodging a charge against Israel. My people, what have I done to you? How, how have I burdened you? Answer me. I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I send Moses to lead you, also Aaron and Miriam. My people remember what Balak, the king of Moab, answered, and what Balaam, son of Beor, answered. And he moves on to say, remember your journey from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord? and bow down before the exalted God. Shall I come before him with the burnt offerings, with the caves and calves? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with, the, with um, 10,000 of rivers, rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? I would like you to take note of what verse eight says. The call is, this is what pleases the Lord. It says, he has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before your God. Let me repeat that again. Verse number eight. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before the Lord. Let me submit to us tonight that the creator of the universe <clears throat> is revealed in scripture to us as the God of inclusivity, God who embraces all. His nature and being is demonstrated in Genesis chapter one, verse 27, 
as encompassing of all humanity and other aspects of creation. Two specific actions, I, I mean, um, aspects I'm going to point out is first, the Godhead nature of God speaks of God's intent to live as a community, to incorporate everyone. That is what Christians we call as the Godhead, sometimes use the word Trinity. God living and functioning as three in one. We don't see competition between the Godhead. We see collaboration. We see working together. The another term that is used today is let us make, in the Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 b the Bible talks about let us make man. The use of the plural terms, they again show inclusion of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit becoming one. May I propose to us tonight that all the terms we are using, terms like inclusivity, justice, devolution, shalom, all these terms draw their origin from God, the maker of heaven and earth, because that is nature. In his vision, dream, and a plan for all creation, God envisions a community that exists by embracing one another. This is what should inform our efforts, our formulations, and our interventions in trying to overcome the challenges that have been brought to our society by exclusion. Man is also created in the image of God, and therefore he is created with an innate ability to be able to work as a corporate working together with others. One of the examples I want to close with tonight, because of time, I just to skip a few aspects, is this. The dream of God is that everyone, weak, strong, rich, poor, no matter the gender they exist in, must belong to the entire community of God's people. And that's why sin in Genesis chapter 3 brought about the fall by fall, introduced words like exclusion, discrimination, corruption, and all that kind of term, those kind of terms. Tonight, as we do this very special event, my submission to us is this is an effort towards partnering with God in promoting unity, in inclusion. And that is why in, in Micah chapter 5, chapter 6, God reminds us that we need to embrace one another for the glory of God. He has entrusted us the responsibility to be partakers with God in what he's doing. <coughs> so somebody may ask why a book launch and a devotional thought? It's because these are not two separate events. The effort of this book that will be introduced to us today is basically part of partnering with God in returning man to the original vision of God, working as a unity, including everybody, regardless of their gender, their race, or their age, becoming one in this ministry. Therefore, I want to challenge us and pray that we remember as we connect tonight that what this book is all about is exactly partnering with the Mecca in becoming contributors of this. I close with a, a quote from Richard Peart, who wrote an article by the title, William Wilberforce and the Abolition of Slave Trade. Did you know? And he said in his scripture, no national crime is condemned so frequently and they feel so strongly as oppression and cruelty. In brackets, exclusivity, and not using the best of our endeavors to deliver fellow creatures from them. It is our prayer as Cabrak Universe that this effort will become a means and a source of delivering humanity from the grips of the exclusion and other forms of oppression. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we can quietly join together tonight to have a conversation. A conversation as we witness the launch of a book that bears information that is central to the transformation of humanity. We live in a fallen world, a world marred by situations where we term some as outsiders, others as insiders, 
And in your time on the planet Earth, you witnessed such. And no wonder using the model of the children of Israel, you were able to show why we need to embrace and incorporate each person, regardless of their limitations, to be partakers of this great community of humanity. So we pray today that this event will bring honor and glory to your name. We pray for all the facilitators that we will truly experience your presence. Would you guide us through as you use our moderator and as you use all those who speak, that this event will bring glory to your name. We give ourselves to you now for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Reverend Justice Mutuku for that devotional thought. A child grew up loving the stars. It dreamt of becoming an astronaut, an astrologer, anything to get closer to the stars. It spent all its days looking up, studying the stars wherever it went. One day while walking, the child fell into a hole. It's found it crying in the hole and said, you cannot get to the stars if you cannot keep your feet. You must see where you are before you can know where you are going. Welcome to the launch of this book, Decentralization and Inclusion in Kenya. From pre-colonial times to the first decade of devolution. It is edited by Professor John Osogo and Caroline Kiyoko, and it is published by the Kabarak University Press and the Heinrich Paul Stiftung. It's my hope that you are all as excited as I am to see this book come to fruition at the end of the first decade of devolution under the Constitution of Kenya, and at the dawn of the next decade. Today, we will look behind so that we can see where we go ahead. With that, I welcome Professor John Sogo Apani, Dean of the Law School, to start the program. Thank you, Sam. Um, Sam is my colleague, um, and you've heard how philosophical he can be. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how to speak after this uh, serious, uh, you know, prophesying of, of, of knowledge. Um, if you permit me, I'll keep the protocols as uh, were announced by our moderator earlier on, and I salute my seniors who I respect very much. Um, but some must have forgotten one protocol, which is my domestic protocol. Some did you see my family? I think. <laughs> <laughs> Where are they? Are they? <laughs> Serious professors, can you stand up? <laughs> yes, that's Professor Junior. <laughs> that is Dr. Asala. Yes, yes. <laughs> Professor Izo. And there's another one, Nicole. Yeah, my family has come to support me. And I think we should establish that protocol as well. <laughs> At least they are with church. Yeah. Um, the, the, recently, I had some um, reflections, and uh, I kept wondering whether my best days are ahead of me or they are past. I don't know that you've had those reflections before. Um, I think a few years back. And every time I thought I had seen my best, I think God surprises me with another better another best until I've run out of superlatives now. Maybe Sidi Okumu will give me <laughs> the next way of saying, uh, you know, it's my way of saying I'm really, really happy and honored. I'm happy and honored to see um, people from, from different uh, cadres of life coming to join us to celebrate the fruits of our labor. It is something that we take with honor, with humility, and we respect, and we shall respect back. Um, I'm honored to have friends like um, Andrew Paul Foundation here um, who have stood with us, worked with us and supported us to make this research possible. I'm honored to have my vice chancellor leading an entire team from Kabarak that includes two vice chancellors, um, professors, um, that includes law school faculty, that includes my own chaplain, 
and, and I think that's a great honor to have a vice chancellor leave Nakuru for you. It's something that you should thank God for some time. I'm quite honored for that. I'm also honored by my friends, um, you know, from the human rights work. And then right here, my sister, Dr. Joyce Mutinda, who has come all the way from Europe. I think we spoke last week, she was in Geneva, uh, to come and support this course. That is not something to forget. It's, it's quite an honor. And then we take it with all the humility that it deserves. I'm here also with uh, my regulator, <laughs> Dr. Ambua Katuku. Uh, for those who know what I mean, it means my school will not be closed. <laughs> I have a salary for some more days. <laughs> Isn't it, Dr. <laughs> yeah, my regulator is here with us, uh, just celebrate us. I'm here also uh, with the former Chief Justice, William Tunga, who honored me that much that he joined me in Kaldarak as part of law school faculty. I don't know how much honor you can get. And today, we are also joined by the immediate former Chief Justice, uh, Honorable Justice David Maraga. I think that's a very, very, very high, high, high honor. Sibi Okumo, I need, I need relatives now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so but we really want the Scabara community to have, to have all of you here and to have you respecting us, honoring our call to come and join the book with us. That's not something to take for granted. And we thank God for that opportunity. And finally, um, and you'll, you'll notice this comes last, a group of fantastic students in Cabra Law School um, that have done sleepless nights with us, literally writing this book. Um, if you're here, just stand up so that we can see you. The, the midnight group that was eating Mutungo, my <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, they've been in the office of the lecturers several nights. Um, if you find time to see the book later, you will see how many graphs I need. We have to digest thousands of data and interpret that and reduce that to what can be explained and studied. Our students helped us a lot and for free, they didn't ask for money. Um, they asked just to support the research and to make Kenya better through that kind of work. Another honor, I think, if you asked me. Finally, just to make one or two comments about our calling, which is the academic calling that we stand for or stand with. And I'm always um, fascinated by the story of Joseph um, in many ways. I think if there was a model uh, to pick, then for me to be Joseph. But then there's a day um, Joseph does something quite interesting, and it is the day he's asked by the, the, the king to interpret the dream. And uh, I think the king has seen some fat animals, and then they become thin, and the king is stranded, doesn't know what to do about that. And so he asks Joseph, um, come and, you know, you, you, you dreamer, come and help me interpret this dream. And Joseph gives him an answer, he tells him, look, there'll be seven years of plenty, after which there'll be seven years of uh, hunger. And the king asks, so what are we supposed to do? And then he says, um, what we need to do is simple. During the days when there's plenty, so let us store. During the days when there is hunger, we consume what we were storing when there's plenty. That's how simple it is. And he volunteers. I think the king asks him, requests him, and he volunteers to be the person in charge of that store. And I keep wondering um, whether there's any lesson there for a lawyer or a legal academic like myself. And the more I think about that story, uh, the more I'm convinced that that's exactly what God wants us to do, um, to use our talents, to put them at the disposal of the Republic, of our people, and to solve their problems. And no other talent for us other than the capacity to research, um, to dig into the information, to see trends and patterns, and warn communities and warn the people, so the leaders, that if we don't do this, we are likely to have this. But if we want to avoid that, then we have got to do this. And I think that's exactly what we are doing with this book. So while he was a prophet um, from a spiritual angle, I think we are prophets from an intellectual angle. So if I was to coin, which is what we do as academics, if Joseph was a, a spiritual prophetica, then we are going to be intellectual prophetica. Yet for us in Kabarak, we mix the two. And so I think we get a more serious breed that comes out of that. And hence the celebration we're going to have today.
So as you enjoy with us, please remember that it's our duty to do that, to help society to see what it could not have seen, uh, to analyze, to digest, to see trends, to see patterns, and hopefully predict the future for a better society. I think those will be my remarks, and I'll be calling upon those um, who are here and who um, understand this calling to be able to support us whenever we come to you. You could have um, uh, some money, you'll come with a bow. You could have um, some words of advice, we'll come again with our ears to listen to you. You could have some good office, we'll come to you as well, seeking to work together so that we make society better through those modes that I've just spoken about. Um, I'm going to thank you, but before that, I think I'll invite my friend and co-host today, um, Mr. Joachim Paul, who is the regional director of um, the Andrew Paul Foundation, that is right here. And they're the ones we've worked together through this process. Thank you very much, and may God bless you. Thank you very much, um, Professor John Abani. So, all protocols observed, I do have all, the, all names on my, my list here, but still, I would like very much to welcome Chief Justice Emeritus David Malaga and to Uli Matunga. Uh, we really appreciate your presence here, as well uh, Dr. Joyce Mukan, um, Professor Henry Kinlanka, and um, yeah, Professor John Abani already mentioned the team of the Kabarak Law School um, to, 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 to co author it, um, the study that we're presenting today, as well two co authors. Um, oh, does it work? Okay, sorry. I hope you could you could understand. Yeah, okay. Sorry, I didn't notice. <laughs> um, no, I do. So, um, two co-authors with um, I, I'd like to mention Ms. Petronella Mukaindi, uh, Deputy Director of Kenya National Commission on Human Rights, and our dear former colleague um, Caroline Kyoko who worked at our foundation as the program coordinator, Gender Democracy, and who was a driving force as well behind this project. Thank you all uh, for accepting our invitation. Um, I also like um, to mention my team who are here, my team of Heinrich Bell Foundation, even not everyone, everyone has been involved in this project, but all showed up and participate tonight. So it's great to have you with us today also. Um, we are glad um, we could gather this evening to discuss marginalization in Kenya and the struggle for inclusion of marginalized groups in the context, in the context of the devolution since the inception of the constitution in Kenya in 2010. This book um, I have here, I saw the printout on the day, today, I must say, um, this book talks about the colonial history of this country, how the colonial system transcended into the post-colonial state, and how the constitution of 2010 aimed at creating a new social and political reality. Um, regular citizens, and I have this point now from the introduction of the book, I thought it was really worth mentioning this. Regular citizens are now being put in the center, regardless of their gender, sex, age, disability, potential disability, um, ethnicity, and all sorts of other reasons for identifying with a minority, or being made a minority or considered a minority or marginalized. Um, as, the as the introduction of this book put it um, as well, the constitution aimed at building a state that for the first time in its history must serve its people, um, which I found a remarkable sentence, I must say, especially that um, the constitution states clearly that the people the people in general include marginalized groups, namely women, youth, differently abled persons, minorities in ethnic terms, and other groups, including social minorities, um, yes, and all other groups who are marginalized. 
Now, it should not be my job to talk about the research and to talk about the constitution as we have those who brought the constitution to my life here with us and legal experts who did the study I wrote about it. Um, um, but I will say a few words why we as Heinz Heinrich Foundation engage in this conversation. It's actually 20 years old. So yeah. Our office just visited in, in just right, right to the corner. Um, we are a non profit organization and part of our global movement. And the footprint in over 30, actually, in the United States countries, it's going to be in an office and a program. Mm -hmm. As the office. So our focus is mainly on also Uganda and So we work on uh, to uh, you know to advance progressive political and socioeconomic transformation through our program on sustainable development, gender democracy, dialogue, and civic spaces. We also work, and this became increasingly important, on agroecology and food and the right to food. Uh, increasingly important in the current context. Um, our gender democracy program contributes to the transformation of gender relations in Kenya and the region in order to realize human rights for all members of a diverse society. We have our banner here, I noticed actually, which says, and I think it's telling, which says enhancing exclusive, inclusive democratic societies grounded on human rights and principles of gender democracy, feminism and diversity in the region. This is what we're trying to do. And this is what we're trying to do with our partnership with the law school of Kabarak University. And uh, we sincerely hope that we're also certain that the book will stimulate the debate which will provide knowledge in the implementation of the letter of the constitution and promotion of the spirit of inclusivity at the nation, national, and maybe even more importantly, at the county levels. I would like to stop here and looking forward to an interactive session. Asenteni, thank you very much. Great to have you all here. Thank you very much. Um, I would like just to usher in very quickly Professor John Achola, the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Financial Administration at Kabrak University. Our chief guest, Honorable Justice David Maraga, Chief Justice Emeritus, Honorable Justice Professor Willie Mutunga, Chief Justice Emeritus, Professor Henry Kiplangat, the Vice Chancellor of Kabaraki University. <coughs> all the distinguished guests, all protocols observed. Good evening. Good evening. Professor Ambani, I observed that you started a good trend which must be kept going by introducing the members of your family. <laughs> <laughs> I am also proud to introduce a member of my family in this congregation who is ably representing our family, who is none other than Dembat Ochola, an advocate of the High Court of Kenya. And it's my last one. <laughs> Thank you, Danla. You can be seated. Our chief guest, ladies and gentlemen, this is a great day for us at Kabarak University. A lot of resources and many hours of intellectual rigor 
have been invested in the production of the book being launched this evening. It is therefore with great pleasure that I humbly welcome the wind beneath our wings, our Vice Chancellor, Professor Henry Kiplanat, the Vice Chancellor of Kabarak University, to welcome our guests and make his remarks. Welcome, Vice Chancellor. Let us put our hands together. Our chief guest, Honorable Justice David Maraga, uh, this, uh, Chief Justice Emeritus of the Supreme Court of Kenya. Um, chief Justice Emeritus William Mutunga, Dr. Joyce Mutinda, the Chair, National Gender and Equality Commission. Mr. Joachim Paul, the Regional Director, Henry Paul Stifton Foundation. Apologies. Um, seems we're having problems with the power. Um, well, let me try to project my voice. I hope you'll hear me. Um, so I have to start afresh. Uh, our chief guest, uh, Honorable Justice David Maraga, uh, the Chief uh, Justice Emeritus of the Supreme Court of Kenya. Um, Dr. William Mutunga, the Chief Justice Emeritus of the Supreme Court of Kenya. Uh, Dr. Joyce Mutinda, the Chair of National Gender and Equality Commission. Mr. Joachim Paul, the Regional Director, Enrich Foundation. Um, Dr. Wambua Kituku, the Secretary of uh, the Council of Legal, Legal Education. Mr. Joseph Malinda, the Clerk of the Dutch North Coming Absentia, the Clerk of County Assembly of Nakuru. Um, Ms. Mukaindo, the Deputy Director of Kenya National Commission on Human Rights. The senior members of Kabra University Management Board who are here. Uh, Dr. Ochoda, Professor Ochoda Rada, the DBC Academics and Research, uh, Professor Tepulo of the DBC AF, uh, the University Chaplain, Reverend uh, uh, Justice Mutuku, the Kabara University students. We have the law school uh, staff led by Professor John Osobo Abani, our dean, members of the academic staff of Kabarak University Law School, the members of the academic staff from other universities, members of the legal fraternity and civil society, partners, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Um, I am delighted to welcome all of you to this auspicious ceremony hosted by Kabarak University in collaboration with Henrich Foundation. Our chief guest, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to talk in a few words about Kabarak University, the School of Law, and the Kabarak University Press. Uh, Kabarak University was founded 22 years ago uh, by His Excellency Honorable Daniel Toroy Chicharamo, the second president of the Republic of Kenya. And on June 25th, 2010, uh, the late President Moy proceeded to launch the Kabarak University School of Law. 
building on the solid foundation laid by His Excellency President Moore, the Universal Council, upon the recommendations of the First Senate, approved the establishment of the Kabarak University Press in 2021, just last year. And the main objective for the establishment of the Kabarak University Press was to support scholarship and research by publishing and disseminating academic resources, including books, monographs, and research journals. Uh, chief guest, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to uh, this evening to inform you that the Kabarak University Press has lived up to that objective. We have three strong evidences to support this claim. And I think for you lawyers, most of whom are here and uh, practicing and um, make decisions, you rely on evidence. So I want to give you evidence to show that uh, <laughs> this school has lived up to its objective. The first evidence is that early this year, thank God, <laughs> early this year, Kabarak University Press edited the first, um, sorry, edited and published Professor William Mutunga's inaugural lecture as a sessional academic monograph. <laughs> and for your information, Professor William Mutunga, Chief Justice Emeritus, is a professor of public law at Kabarak University School of Law. I, I hear people refer to him as Dr. Mutunga. He's a professor. <laughs> and he earned it. Uh, he qualifies to be one. Second, in July this year, Kabarak University published a remarkable book entitled Power, Politics and Law, The Dynamics of Constitutional Change in Kenya, 1897 to 2022. The book was authored by Professor Gidu Muigai, Attorney General Emeritus, and we launched the seminal publication on July 15th of this year. So this one is going to be our second book in the year 2022. Thirdly, the Kabarak University Press turns out distinctive academic journals, namely the Journal of Law and Ethics and the Kabarak University Students <coughs> Law Review. Finally, the chief guests, ladies and gentlemen, this evening we are here to launch another landmark book published by Kabarak University Press. The book entitled Decentralization and Inclusion in Kenya from Pre-Colonial Times to the First Decade of Revolution is divided into various chapters authored by Professor John Osoko Ambani, Mr. Elisha Ongoya, Mr. Humphrey Sipala, and Madam Luciana Thuo, all from Kabarak University School of Law. Uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Petronis, Petronella Mukaindo, the Deputy Director, Kenya National Commission of, on Human Rights, and Ms. Caroline Kiyoko, former Program Coordinator, Gender Democracy, Henry Foundation. Can you stand so that we can appreciate you? If you don't mind. Let's appreciate you. Thank you very much. Very much. Very much. Very much. Very much. I am sure you burned the midnight oil, and sometimes you even miss your sleep because you had to ensure that the book was finally published. The chief guest, ladies and gentlemen, Place yourself where I am, and you will certainly agree with me that the Kabarak University Press has made us very proud. It has raised our public profile and reputation as a university. It has distinguished Kabarak Law School as a good governance academy of Kenya's legal scholarship. We have indeed become a center of excellence in legal pedagogy and a powerhouse in legal research and legal publications in the Eastern Africa region. I think we deserve it. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the university remains cognizant of the fact that to raise well-trained, all-rounded lawyers, we require resources well beyond our immediate technical, financial, and human resources. And to this end, the university is keen on the establishment of strategic partnerships with like-minded organizations to provide opportunities and resources that enhance and further our research 
innovation and outreach mission. In the year 2021, Kabarak University School of Law partnered with Enrich Foundation to conduct research on evolution and how it has impacted marginalized groups such as women, youth, and persons with disabilities since devolved county governments were rolled out in the year 2013. The case studies for the research were Garissa, Kakamega, Nakuru, Narok, and Mombasa counties. And this study was undertaken in recognition of the fact that as a university, we occupy a special place in the society as a center of excellence in research, innovation, and outreach. Out of this research, the law school hosted the Kabrak Annual Law Conference on 15th and 16th of June this year, where the research findings were subjected to rigorous interrogation by the participants from the select counties, National Council of Persons with Disabilities, the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights, National Gender and Equality Commission, academic institutions, and other civil society sectors. The feedback we received became value building blocks for the book we are launching this evening. The chief guest, ladies and gentlemen, the book we are launching today appraises the first decade of the evolution of power in Kenya. Its main preoccupation is to discover whether the evolution in Kenya has had a significant impact on the political rights of the marginalized groups identified in Article 100 of the 2010 Constitution. The book tracks the struggles for decentralization and inclusion by those on the outside and an efforts to congest power at the center and to exclude the others by those at the center from pre-independent days. A walk through our history shows us that there have always been problems bigger than the structure of government itself in the story of marginalization, including the legacy of colonialization or colonialism and a state wire to exclude and to extract for those at the center of political power among others. The book reaches a clear conclusion. Whenever we centralized, we marginalized, and whenever we decentralized, we move towards inclusion. Thus, it is an inescapable conclusion that evolution in fact brings government closer to the people and inclusion by all its fundamental to prosperity of the nation. Notably, such participation includes that of the youth, that of women, and that of persons with disabilities, ethnic minorities, and marginalized communities within counties. The chief guest, ladies and gentlemen, this book comes at a time when we are <coughs> entering into the second decade of evolution. The book offers us a chance to reflect on what is working and what is not, and to draw best practices from the various counties where devolution is working for counties that may be struggling with its implementation. As a university, we are proud to be at the forefront in championing discourses of immediate relevance to the public. It is my sincere hope that the national government and the county, the county government will embrace this study as a blueprint for devolution in the next decade to ensure that the gains from the first cycle of devolution are consolidated. For the counties where devolution appears to have had a false start, it is my hope that this study will demonstrate that devolution can be a success story and that they can benchmark with those counties where devolution has succeeded. Ultimately, for our chief guests, ladies and gentlemen, I wish to thank most sincerely our partner, Henry Paul Stiftung. Thank you very much, Mr. Joachim Paul, and your entire team for sharing your expertise with us and extending a, general, a generous financial support towards this project, including the funding, uh, including funding the field visits, the validation conference, the publication of the book, and today's book launch. You are invaluable input has enabled us to witness yet another milestone. Can we clap?
So I also wish to thank most sincerely the participants from the selected county governments and peer institutions who participated in the validation conference and interrogated the site material. Kindly accept our expression of gratitude for your contribution to the success. In the same vein, I would like to thank Professor John Osogo Ambani, the Dean of the Law School and Lead Investigator for leading this, his team to develop such a <coughs> time before. Um, and I would also like to thank and appreciate your support system. <laughs> you are good wife and your children who I believe have given you uh, maximum support. <laughs> yeah, the only problem is that you're operating in two cities. So we hope one day you will operate in one city. <laughs> Um, so thank you very much, uh, Professor Ambani, for what you've done. I, I am equally grateful to all the participants who honored our invitation to participate in this launch. So before I welcome our chief guest to address this gathering, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome the following distinguished guests uh, to make uh, brief remarks. I uh, will begin with Dr. Joyce Mutina, the Chair, National Gender and Equality Commission, because I'm told uh, Dr. Amua Kituku hasn't arrived. I guess he has arrived. Oh, he has arrived. <coughs> All right. Okay, so I, I received what I just said. Uh, um, so just allow me to end my remarks there first, so that um, I can welcome um, Mr. Joseph Mutinda, the clerk of County Assembly of Napoli. Please welcome. Thank you. The clerk has the right, but I uh, yeah. to be the one. Uh, All right. Okay. I go back. Dr. Wangua Kichuku, please welcome. Sorry. Um, allow me to <coughs> adopt the protocol that you initiated before. Um, so, chief guests, uh, distinguished guests, uh, members of uh, faculty, students, uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening. So, um, Professor Ambani has uh, in, informed all of you, in fact, uh, inculcated uh, seeds of fear in all of you that. Uh, we are here to close down universities as a council of legal education. But that is far from the truth. Um, we have a, a dual mandate. One is to regulate legal education at all levels in Kenya. But the second uh, broad mandate is to promote legal education. And uh, that is why I'm here. Uh, we are required to do so by uh, building capacities of legal education providers. But also importantly, to recognize and uh, celebrate excellence in legal education. And uh, for that reason, um, I'm very happy, and our council is happy to be associated with uh, Kabarak University for this important, important milestone. Um, I've known Professor Ambani uh, for more than two decades now. Um, he is, uh, in his own right, a uh, very top of the publishing house. <laughs> and uh, I mean, right from his days at, um, at Center for Law and Research International, glad in the 90s, uh, early 2000s, as a, as, a, as a program officer there, he was responsible for editing and ensuring uh, several publications of that NGO had done, and done very well. So, um, so I'm happy here to see that Professor Ambani has brought the same energy and uh, rigor at Kabarak University. Um, and also, Kabarak University, um, what you're doing 
I think uh, needs to be recognized and appreciated by everybody. Out of the 15 universities and colleges that we regulate as CLE, uh, only five have established uh, journals, uh, law journals, and publish uh, regularly. Uh, Kabarak is one of them. Therefore, um, as, as council, uh, we look forward to partnering with Kabara to encourage and build capacities in the other 10 legal education providers to establish a viable uh, university presses and uh, establish the tradition of uh, publishing journals. So for that, we will be we will reach out to Kabarak and uh, we hope that we shall uh, forge a partnership in that regard. Um, regarding the book that is being launched, I um, also congratulate Kabarak for um, putting this together. The subject is, of course, extremely topical. Um, evolution, in my view, um, and also based on what I did from my doctoral studies. And evolution gave us two important uh, promises. And now that this is coming at uh, 10 years, 10 years after the um, election of uh, the first set of uh, county governments, um, one major promise was, of course, decentralization. And uh, in my study, um, even though evolution required that we decentralize, beyond the county up to the village level. Uh, very few counties were able to do that. Much of the power and decision making remained at county level. So it's good to see, I mean, to read from the book, uh, what has been done since and uh, what can be done to help us realize that important uh, uh, promise of evolution. Um, and also how do we challenge decentralization? because it's something that keeps on uh, creeping back. Um, the second promise, of course, is uh, inclusion. Um, but then we've seen in the 10 years of evolution also, uh, the majorities in counties have continued to have their say and way to the exclusion of uh, marginalized groups. And therefore, through the powers given to county governments, like um, legislating, um, distribution of uh, resources, uh, and promoting public participation. How can we ensure that the minorities are marginalized within counties also get to have their say? So um, this is an important publication, and uh, as also uh, a scholar, I feel sufficiently challenged by Kabarak University also to pen down uh, a book on uh, what I really uh, like about evolution. And that is within the context of uh, environmental law and governance. So I, on behalf of council, I wish to uh, again, once again, sincerely thank uh, Kabarak University and uh, congratulating for this milestone and uh, hope that you will help us advance the mandate of council, which is uh, not very well known. That is which, I mean, that is to promote legal education this country through best practices and institutional excellence. I congratulate you once again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Kituku, for those remarks. And thank you very much for speaking on behalf of Dr. University. And I would like to um, assure you that as soon as you get ready to pen your book, the team at Kabarak University has <laughs> <laughs> two promises now uh, for book qualifications, and uh, we are keeping a list. And, uh, we will remind you if you take too long. <laughs> So thank you very much. And the Kabarak University, of course, partners with CLE. And um, we are ready to, to work with you uh, because we are advancing people um, education, the highest common good of this country.
Um, at this point, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to invite the chairperson of National Gender and Equality, Dr. Joyce Mikali Tinda, to address the question.
says we should contact and coordinate research. And it is not only every research, it is research activities on matters relating to equality and freedom from discrimination as contemplated in Article 27 of the Constitution of Kenya. So when a university wakes up and takes up some subject, that takes care of discrimination. Because when you talk of inclusion, you are expansive, you are taking away uh, discrimination. So when a university takes that route, we are interested in that research. And that is why you found us as stakeholders in your validation workshop. That is why I'm here today. And I said, I'll say it again and repeat to all of us, this research would not go to waste. Osogo and the group, congratulations. Thank you very much because you have given me the weapon that I required to face the 13th parliament. You have said, and allow me for this one, I will not go, you will just read a bit. Allow me and there is this interesting finding that what is happening in our counties is per Article 177. That idea of having so many women so that you get two thirds has worked at that level. And this research finds that that same one, they have said they recommend the same one to be applied to the National Assembly. Thank you very much for giving me yeah. that. Because I would move with this one and go and tell Wetambula, yes, it is here. <laughs> this is research. Yes. Yes. It is not me saying. Yeah. It is not activism. Yes. Yes. Now, this is factual. Mm -hmm. Somebody has gone out in the field, has been to Garissa, has been to other counties, and found out that this one can work for us. So let's not say that two thirds cannot work. That principle can work. Let us not stay in the courts. It is something that Kabarak has said, just like somebody talked here about them. It's simple. Let's not look out there. It's simple. You have been told, go to Article 177 and bring it to the So that when we are constituting the Senate, we are constituting um, the National Assembly, we have no problem with the two thirds. <laughs> We will follow that to the very end because now I can see the recommendations. Now, the other big finding that I found here is that we are not reversing what has been going on. Instead, the women movement, if you call it the women movement, because that is what people say, they call gender women movement, has gained momentum and we are moving forward. The gains are not going to be are they going to be reversed? I doubt, not by the 13th parliament, not when His Excellency the President has assured us of two things. One, two thirds gender principle is going to be legislated by the 13th parliament. That's what he has said. He has also said we'll expect 50% of his cabinet to be women. And I'm waiting. In fact, it is this week. I'm waiting and praying. And because Kabarak prays a lot, please pray for us <laughs> because we need that 50%. And just as I finish, because reading a whole speech at night is not one of the best things, as I finish, allow me not only to thank those people who sat and thought of this research, but also those who went out, the youngsters who went out and collected the data, those who came and analyzed, those who went and stayed in this place they call the press, editing, and after that, the publication is out with us. You have done a great job. And I want to look to what happened with our elections. For who don't know, NCIC conducted a research about uh, where we are likely to get violence. And they did, they got the spots all over the country. And they came and shared with us. I was there when they were sharing. And when it was shared, we decided, let us not only preach peace, but make sure that the hotspots are marked. The hotspots were marked. One of those is Nakuru. And I think you found a lot of us in Nakuru. 
And another one, unfortunately, was in Mombasa. Uh, quite a number of us there. And here in Nairobi, we knew the places to flare. And there, we took charge. Now, why is this success for peace? Because of researchers, because of research. Why are we going to realize success? Because Kabrak has conducted this research that I'm going to take forward. And I promise, I, I will not say I promise in my honor, but I promise that I'll surely take it forward and we'll see the results as we pray for one another. Thank you very much for the partners who have worked with Cabra. Thank you very much for those of, of us who came today to witness this baby in terms of the book just being launched today. And thank you very much, Cabra once more, for making me meet with a man who swore me into office on the 29th of August, uh, 2018. God bless us all and God bless Cabra and in particular, the researchers. Thank you. Uh, please appreciate um, those comments. Uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, allow me now to introduce the uh, chief guest. And um, I would like to state that Honorable Justice David Maraga requires no introduction because he's a household name nationally, regionally, and internationally. Honorable Justice Maraga is one of the most decorated lawyers in the country, having served with distinction as an advocate of the High Court of Kenya, as a judge of the High Court of Kenya, as a judge of the court. High court of the Court of Appeal, and as a 14th Chief Justice and President of the Supreme Court of Kenya. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Honorable Justice David Maraga, Chief Justice Emeritus, and let us give him an undivided attention. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kimanat. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to be here this evening. I'm happy to be here this evening because I'm been able to see friends I haven't seen for a long that time. See we were in a function together where I spoke about cricket. <laughs> at the Nairobi Club, you remember? Indeed, indeed. Several years back. Ngoya, I'm, I'm, I'm meeting him in a different forum. <laughs> you, you, you know what forum? You know where he is normally. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> where he's very, very vocal. CJ Emeritus, Professor Mutunga, was my lecture at the University of Nairobi. So you can see we've come a long way. <laughs> and uh, it is it was interesting that time, I, I mean, I took over from him. <laughs> Professor uh, Kaplagat, the Vice Chancellor, Kaplagat University, Dr. Joyce. <laughs> Gender Chairperson of the Gender Commission, Mr. Joachim Paul, the Regional Director, Henrich Foundation, and ladies and gentlemen, all protocols observed. As I said, I'm delighted this evening to be with you here. I received the invitation to grace this occasion as the Chief Guest, very humbly and warmly, for two important reasons. First, I'm a firm believer 
incredible legal education because a, a country's legal system and indeed the society as a whole can only be as strong as the learning and education that its lawyers receive. Second, even in my retirement, I continue to champion the ideals of our constitution, including devolution, democracy, equality, and non-discrimination, which incidentally are also the focus of the book that we are launching tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to speak about these subjects of legal education, our constitution, and the book briefly, after which we shall hear more from the scholars themselves. Our people aspire to have a society whose true and primary foundation and pillars are just respect and adherence to the rule of law. This is only possible when we have a legal profession whose members are not only competent in the knowledge and application of the legal, of the law and the legal practice, but also when we have a body of lawyers that have integrity, human values, and virtues that are espoused in the constitution itself. As we all know, a society is as good as its values. In this regard, as an institution with Christian foundations, in its philosophy and approach to teaching and learning, we have an expectation that professionals who go through your hands reflect the same standards and values, which are integrity, discipline, hard work, and all the ethical and moral values that form the package of Christian virtue in the contemporary world. These values are only achievable where they are inculcated very early in places such as the families, churches, and learning institutions. As such, I am happy to learn that Kabarak Law School is in the process of laying out a strategic framework with a view of setting a very high bar for excellence, ethics, and the virtue in legal education. Titled Our Commitments, the strategic plan of Kabarak Law School aims to impart the universe through excellent legal education, cutting edge legal and interdisciplinary research, and devoted community service, all of them from the ethical and the biblical perspectives. As one who has immensely benefited from Christian values, I associate myself not just with excellent legal education, research and community service, particularly with the Christian foundations in the approach to learning. As some of you may recall, when determining the provision, the, the presidential election petition in 2017, I underlined the principle that, and I quote, the greatness of a nation lies not in the mighty of its armies, important as that is, nor in the, great, in the largeness of its economy, important as that is also, but the greatness of a nation lies in its fidelity to the constitution and the strict adherence to the rule of law, and above all, the fear of God. I have seen that quotation change a bit. <laughs> Instead of the fear of God, some people thought we made a mistake and uh, say uh, respect for God. There is a huge difference. 
This statement was true then, and it remains so today. And only lawyers with a solid foundation, such as that Kabarak University promises, can be relied upon to realize these ideals. This is why I am proudly associated with the Kabarak University. I trust that you are going to lay even a stronger foundation and I will not need to change my view on that. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, our constitution carries with it a big promise. In fact, many commentators, including judicial officers, have class classified it as a transformative constitution. You need to read Professor Mtunga's judgments and you will see that all through. I agree with this view because our constitution charts a new path for our people. It is already acting as a bridge between a past ritual with tyranny, centralized authority, exclusion and marginalization at multiple levels and a future all inclusive democratic society where the people reign sovereign. Power is dispersed far and wide and the language of human rights is its recognized currency. Looking at our past, we have come a long way. There were days when women's rights or their political inclusion did not matter. I talk here about the days when an entire cabinet would be named without a female member. Dr. Mutinda, you, you are lucky you, you have some already. <laughs> when superior courts of record were the preserve of white or Asian men, and the parliament was a privilege of the older men, all this despite the fact that women are not only just as qualified as men are to lead, but also possess intrinsic and unique leadership perspectives that men don't have. The remit of this address does not permit me to say much about the unique contribution women, youth, and persons with disabilities make to the development and well being of any society. Suffice it to say, however, that empirical research has shown that women have an innate ability to hold their egos in check, take time to listen instead of reacting right away, and as, an, as natural multitaskers with empathy and emotional intelligence also coming more naturally to them than men, women have the ability to decisively and quickly respond to simultaneous and different tasks or problems at a time at a time which is a critical component of successful leadership. One time I was in, the, in, 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 in a conference and a pastor talked about men thinking in a straight line. I wondered and, and, and I waited. He said, ask a man to go and pick something. If it is in a supermarket, he will go there and pick what he was told and come with it home. I was wondering whether that pastor talked to my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Because oftentimes, my wife would ask me to pass through the supermarket and pick some sugar. I would walk very fast to the supermarket, get any of the, 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 what, the workers in the supermarket and ask, where is sugar? <laughs> he would point to where it is, pick it, pay, and walk out. When I get home, my wife says, Look, you brought sugar. You didn't think about what goes with sugar. 
Ini aja sih itu sih berindin tuh. So you can see how uh, ladies are able to task. At times, yeah, even now I go with my wife to the supermarket and uh, and and I push the trolley. She picks. She says, "Look, I'm going to pick two, three items." But at the end of the day, the the trolley is full. <laughs> Despite these unique leadership qualities, best. Based on uh, Odia's notions of patriarchy, the exercise of political power in our country remains uncivil and has largely uh, maintained a constant exclusion of women who constitute more than 50% of our population from mainstream political representation, a fact that has not only become an obstacle to women's advancement and development, but has also impeded their participation in many societal issues that we face as a nation. It is, in, it is not only women who have been excluded from mainstream political representation. Despite the risk we run of unleashing the youth bulge into a, demogra a demographic disaster instead of transforming it into a demographic uh, demographic dividend, we even consider the youth voice as an irritant. Talk to the politicians and you will see that. Despite the fact that God has endowed most persons with disabilities with enormous and unique potential that ordinary people don't uh, possess, we have not given much thought to their plight, but instead, our conscience remains undisturbed and unsteered by their challenges, leading us to invariably consider them as outcasts. Marginalization has also not has, has uh, also been experienced in some regions of our country. Certain areas, particularly in the in the coast and the former northern frontier districts were relegated from the development agenda and their fate was sealed through visual policies such as the infamous session of paper number 10 of 1965. Cognizant of these anomalies, I'm happy to note that uh, the Kabara Close School has found it imperative to highlight provisions of our constitution meant to remedy, to remedy them. Our constitution, specifically its transformative aspects, seeks to change the above narrative in many and fundamental ways. The, con the constitution provides and requires us to reflect the diversity of our country in all institutions of governance. In essence, this is a rallying call to all of us, leaders and the people, to put into practice the true meaning of nation building and to achieve a society where everyone not only feels part of, but actually and truly belongs to. Being in a normative and binding provisions, the Constitution provides clear obligations, including timelines for the implementation and in some instances, sanctions for non-compliance. The framers understood that, that changing a culture and systems to facilitate aspirations of in, for inclusion meet resistance and therefore put in place mechanisms to ensure implementation. Affirmative action, measures, or opposed to discrimination was deemed necessary in order to correct the past wrongs. Dr. Mutinda, you talked about today being the national day, is it the national day of uh, the, the girl child. Do we have one for the boy child? <laughs> you need seriously to think about that. 
<laughs> I think you should even forget about Father's Day. <laughs> think seriously about the, the, the boy child. He's an endangered species. I cannot tell you that. <laughs> When I was I was in the office, Dr. Mutunga will tell you also. Most of the young lawyers I admitted to the role were ladies. There, there is a day when they were more than three quarters of the whole group, and and, and you you need to ask yourself why that is the case. A clear example is the constitutional provision and a measure to, uh, to ensure gender inclusivity and uh, diversity. The constitutional requirement to ensure every state or public institution, whether appointive or elective, as not more than two thirds of the members of the same gender was one such a requirement. Bearing in mind the leadership perspectives women uh, bring to the governance of their nation that I alluded to earlier, this salient provision of the constitution was clear in terms of its meaning and application. Yet, parliament did not, in my assessment, take seriously the import of this requirement. It was with this in mind, and after a lot of patience with parliament, that as chief justice, I issued the advisory to the former president of the Republic of Kenya, His Excellency Uhuru Kenyatta in 2020 to, to solve parliament for its failure to enact legislation required to realize the two thirds gender rule. I should say that I met very many enemies <laughs> out of the, the, the parliament that has, a, a, I mean, as in the tour of the parliament. Although the matter is still pending in our courts, I consider this an important milestone in our country's pursuit of the ideas of equality and non-discrimination. It is common knowledge that youths and persons with disabilities have not fared any better. It is for these reasons that we should all celebrate the book that we launched today on centralization and inclusion in Kenya from pre-colonial times to the first decade of devolution, which speaks specifically about the issues uh, that we have, we have already uh, enumerated. The book has already, as, as the Professor Kulangat has already uh, stated, explores the conceptual basis for historical relationship for the historical relationship between decentralization and inclusion in Kenya, in chapter two, discusses decentralization in a historical perspective in chapter three, before reviewing inclusion, also historically, and assessing the first decade of devolution in chapter five. The book finds, quite accurately in my view, that our history from the advent of colonialism is one of the struggles for decentralization and inclusion by those on the outside and efforts to congest more powers at the center and to exclude the others by those inside. It also finds, and rightly so, that the clamor for decentralization and inclusion won a major battlefront when the 20 the 10 constitution was entrenched, which entrenched its evolution as one of the overarching principles was promulgated. Indeed, evolution as the new constitution envisions brings with it the promise of a democratic and accountable exercise of power, national unity, self-governance, public participation, social and economic development, provision of proximate services, equitable sharing of national and local resources, uh, the rights and the interests of minorities and the marginalized communities, decentralization and the separation of powers. Kenya's revolution 
is about democracy and accountability and equality and inclusivity, which ideals are critical for the marginalized groups. I'm glad that the book gives us a report of how devolution has fared in these ideals after a decade of implementation and operationalization. Specifically, the book evaluates the objectives of devolution, both to democratize governance and include three marginalized groups, the women, youth, and persons with disabilities. It does so by responding to three main questions. Whether, first, the institutions of uh, county governance incorporated members of the marginalized groups. Second, whether the counties enacted laws and policies that are responsive to the rights and the welfare of the marginalized groups. And third, whether the counties have initiated and continue to implement projects that resonate with the needs of the marginalized groups. Well, it is beyond my remit to convey to you the full findings, the research by the scholars from Kabarak University and the Henrich Foundation. After all, we shall hear from them directly in due course. It suffices that research answers, that the research answers the above questions in the, in the affirmative, even though it points out several areas where devolution and inclusion efforts are still facing serious challenges. After studying our entire history of uh, decentralization and inclusion, the book concludes that there is a positive relationship between decentralization and inclusion of various groups. But the more we decentralize, the more we, we include. Indeed, the very act of dispersing powers and the resources and thereby creating multiple points of decision making ensures that there, there are more spaces and opportunities for inclusion and reflecting diversity. On the other hand, and as the scholars confirm in their findings, the centralization of power is inimical to plurality and inclusion. Indeed, Kenya's pre-2010 history confirms that the more we centralized, the more we marginalized. What is important is that this unfortunate bit of events lies in our history, and I support the call by the others for effective implementation of devolution in order to assist in realizing the full inclusion of the groups which were previously marginalized. And I think they are still marginalized. The development and the completion of this book is a considerable milestone towards the evaluation of the gains that we as a country have made in terms of representation and inclusion of not only women, but also other special interest groups, such as the youth and the persons with disabilities. Interestingly, the book's launch coincides with the end of what we may term as the first decade of devolution and the beginning of the second decade. Ladies and gentlemen, before I sit down, let me appreciate the authors of this indispensable and timely piece by highlighting what I believe to be the principal contributions they have made to the discourse for decentralization and inclusion in Kenya. First, the book traces the evolution of decentralization and inclusion in Kenya through bifato periods, three bifato periods of the country's history. That is from pre-colonial times to the colonization period, and finally to the post-independence equity beginning in 1963. This historical exposition gives the reader the benefit of understanding why devolution took center stage in the deliberations leading to the new constitution and the momentous ramifications 
it holds for the special interest groups outlines in Article 100 of the Constitution. Second, the book provokes us to remember those we often neglect. For example, how often do we reflect on how many positions, on how many persons living with disabilities hold important and influential state and public offices in our country, in our counties, and in our country. The others of the book have gone to great lengths to answer this question through the empirical study of representation in five counties, namely Garissa, Kakamega, Nakuru, Narok, and Mombasa. Third, I believe the contents and the findings of the book provide a roadmap on how the transformative potential of law could be harnessed to improve the to improve the protection of all special interest groups in our country and the challenge not only the institutions of govern of government but also us as members of the public to eternally to be eternally vigilant to secure the implementation of our constitution including articles 27 and 100 it is our vigilance that will enable us to capture and develop progressive practices towards implementing our constitution without isolation. With the above in mind, I have no doubt that the book is a crucial resource for institutions of government, policymakers, trainers, and benchmarking research and development initiatives on decentralization and inclusion, especially on women, youths, and uh, persons with disabilities. I should also say that I am very pleased and encouraged that Kabarak Law School, jointly with the Henrich Foundation, conducted the research, held a validation conference, and the findings culminated in this publication. I believe that this is the actual purpose of our university, to generate knowledge. Further, what encourages most is that both the students and the members of faculty who are involved in this research. This is inspirational and is the way to go in training the next generation of lawyers. I want to thank the researchers, Professor Ambani. And the editors were, of course, Professor uh, Ambani and Caroline Kyoko. So the entire uh, uh, Kabbalah Law School, together with the Enrich Foundation, for delivering this uh, uh, product. Also, uh, thank you, Professor Kiblagat, the Vice Chancellor, Kabarak University, for inviting me to this auspicious book launch. I look forward to working with the uh, Kabarak University, who happen to be my neighbors <laughs> down in Nakuru great institution and I am pleased to learn that you have uh, a printing press. The only one functional in the old country, Mr. Dr. Eh? Yeah. The regulator, please know, you need to know that. <laughs> it is the only university with uh, a printing press and I'm happy that you promised the the, the, that they will uh, publish your book. That's all. I'm happy to see the young lawyers. It feels great. I can tell you, young people, that uh, in all my life, I felt the greatest. 
when I was a student at the University of Nairobi, as a low student at the University of Nairobi. I've never felt greater than that. <laughs> Enjoy yourselves. Thank you very much. May God bless you. Thank you very much, Honorable Chief Justice. Very gracious. Um, we are tired, yes? However, we came to launch a book and we have been talking about people who've written, but we haven't heard from them. Um, is it too much to ask that we meet these people? For three minutes each, they just answer one question that makes us interested about what they wrote, so that when you're buying a book, at least they have uh, whetted your appetite. Yes? Fantastic. I have gotten the concurrence of the Honorable Chief Justice Emeritus. I assume there are no dissents <laughs> in the Court of Public Opinion. So I will ask the authors, um, senior, Lishongwe, please come up. He's my senior. He's not a senior counsel yet. He's a travesty. He's a man. So, Ella, Luciana. Caroline, um, as they come up, I will speak for Sipala, who is not here. And in his chapter, he says something interesting and controversial. He says that the colonial regime was alienated from the people, not only 